So good evening, everybody. I see uh, I see people uh, uh, coming in there in numbers now to our webinar this evening. Uh, you're all very welcome um, and happy new year to you all. Uh, I hope you had a, a, a nice uh, Christmas break and uh, and wonderful to see so many of you signed up for our, our webinar this evening after the holidays. You're obviously all raring to go and to and to, to get back into uh, into uh, uh, nature and, uh, and and find out more about uh, our wonderful wildlife. Uh, we have uh, what I think is going to be a very exciting uh, webinar for you all this evening. Um, before I introduce our guests, um, I'll introduce myself, perhaps, if this is your first time attending an Irish Wildlife Trust webinar. Uh, my name is Porrick. I'm the campaign officer for the Irish Wildlife Trust. And the Irish Wildlife Trust is a national conservation charity. We've been around since 1979. Uh, we're a membership-based organisation and we campaign uh, for the conservation and preservation of our, our wonderful wildlife and our biodiversity. So if you want to support our work um, and get a copy of our magazine and attend our events, etc., please do go onto our website and, uh, and sign up. Just to let you know, this webinar is being recorded and uh, later in the week, I'll put it up on our website and on our YouTube channel. And you'll also find uh, all of our previous uh, webinars that we've been uh, running since uh, since the end of uh, 2020, I think now. Uh, and you'll find all manner of teams there from farming and marine protected areas and uh, climate change and uh, and our last webinar on the the white tailed sea eagle which was which was a, a, a fantastic event and very popular as well and um, now just in terms of uh, logistics before we get stuck in uh, we have three guests for you this evening. Um, each guest will talk for approximately 15 or 20 minutes, and then hopefully we will have a, uh, a, a half an hour then for questions and answers, and we will finish up at 8.30. You will see at the bottom of your screen, uh, there is a chat button and there's a Q&A button. So please feel free to chat amongst yourselves using the chat button. Um, but if you want to ask a question of any of the panelists, please use the Q&A button. Uh, and if your question is for any of the panelists in particular, please make sure just to put that, uh, that name in there so I know that the, the question is directed to that person. Uh, so yeah, so use the Q&A for questions and the chat uh, for, for your own questions. Uh, uh, commentary between yourselves. Uh, very good. So um, without further ado, we're going to talk about uh, sharks uh, tonight. And um, it's a very uh, exciting thing to talk about. I think a lot of people uh, possibly are aware that we have basking sharks in Ireland, but I don't think people are generally aware of the great uh, abundance and diversity of sharks uh, that we have around our coast in Ireland. Uh, I was looking there before the webinar this evening in 2016, the National Parks and Wildlife Service published a report about sharks and rays. So rays are kind of uh, in, the, in the shark family. And we have, they counted 58 species of sharks and rays, which is, uh, which is quite the, the, the phenomenal diversity. And they range from the enormous basking shark to smaller dog fishes uh, and uh, sharks and rays that live out in the deep sea to, to, uh, to, to other, other fish that live in, in much uh, shallow waters. And the other thing that's particularly noticeable about uh, sharks is that nearly two thirds of them uh, in this assessment are threatened with extinction or near threatened with extinction, two thirds imagine. And that is by far the greatest proportion of, of threatened and near threatened species among any of the, uh, the species groups that have been looked at in Ireland. So uh, not only is there great diversity uh, and great interest in shark ecology, but there's also uh, an incredible um, uh, a crisis among uh, sharks in the ocean today and of course that's not confined to Ireland um, so we bear that in mind as we go through our talks today uh, and maybe at the end we can have some discussion about what we can do about that. So I'm going to move on uh, to our first speaker of the evening and um, I'd like to welcome uh, Jenny Bortoluzzi I hope I'm pronouncing your surname right, Jenny. And Jenny is studying uh, uh, her PhD in ecology, behavior, and the reproductive physiology of blue sharks uh, in Trinity College in Dublin. In particular, she's using biochemical and biologging 
tagging methods. So we'll find out more about what those are, I imagine, uh, to understand the diet and the population um, of the blue sharks, uh, why they're visiting our waters and how this links to their reproductive cycle. And I should say as well, before I hand over to Jenny, that unfortunately our webinar is clashing with um, EcoI, which is on the telly right now, and in which Jenny features and her work features. So when we're finished the webinar, we'll all rush on to the RT player and watch uh, EcoI. Uh, so thanks very much, uh, Jenny, and I'm going to hand over to you now. Please share your screen in your own time. Thanks. Uh, okay, let's. We now will have the awkward moment while I share my screen, just waiting around. So you should see my main presentation. Yes, seeing yep. you and hearing you perfectly. Wonderful. So uh, thank you for the introduction, Porik, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, as uh, Porik mentioned, my name is Jenny. I'm a PhD researcher in the fourth year of my PhD at Trinity College Dublin, so final year. Um, and my work looks at the ecology, physiology, conservation and socioeconomic importance of blue sharks in Ireland. Uh, and today I'm just going to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing over the past year uh, in collaboration with uh, Irish anglers and scientists around Ireland. Um, so before I get started on the work itself, I want to introduce you to the star of the show. Uh, you might not know um, that we have blue sharks uh, in our waters here in Ireland. And blue sharks are these stunning animals uh, named for their beautiful deep blue coloration on the top of their bodies. Um, they are sleek and slender and they have these cute little faces with large confused looking eyes, these long pointed snouts uh, dotted with electroreceptors um, that make them really highly inquisitive animals. Um, they love approaching divers and seeing what's going on. Um, and they primarily live in oceanic ecosystems, so out in the middle of the ocean. Um, although they are also known to enter inshore waters, and we saw some spectacular images during the first lockdowns of blue sharks entering marinas. Um, they are viviparous species, that means that they give birth to live young, and typically they give birth to anywhere between four and 135 live young uh, per litter. And these pups can then grow up to measure just under four, four meters long. Um, and the number of pups that they give birth to uh, is actually pretty high for sharks. Um, and it's due to this high reproductive output, um, this high number of pups, that they've historically been one of the most abundant species of oceanic sharks. Um, they occur all around the world in temperate and tropical waters, uh, and that also makes them the most widely distributed shark species in the world. But this high abundance and uh, wide distribution also means that they're the most heavily fished species of sharks in the world. Uh, it, the last IUCN Red List assessment in 2018 classed them as near threatened globally and in Europe. Um, and critically endangered in the Mediterranean. And that's due to heavy fishing pressure through bycatch and target fisheries, um, such as long lining and pelagic trawling. Their fins are actually among the most frequently found on fin markets in Asia, and they're consumed for their meat uh, in many locations, including several European countries, such as France and Spain. Uh, I've seen them on fish in fish markets and supermarkets in France, for example. And just two years ago, um, the images of a blue shark being paraded through paraded through the streets of Plymouth in the UK during a seafood festival went viral. Uh, people were outraged, but what they didn't realize was that the catch retention and sale of this shark is actually completely legal. Uh, so, from a legal point of view, there was nothing wrong with what was happening. Uh, in fact, France, Spain and Portugal are among some of the most prolific shark fishing nations in the world. Uh, they rank among the top 20 and their catches primarily consist of blue sharks. Uh, and these sharks are caught mostly on the high seas. Uh, the high seas are these areas of the ocean outside of national jurisdiction uh, where there are no international limits on catch or trade of this species. So in the Atlantic alone, where we are, just under 70,000 tons of blue sharks are thought to be caught every year. 
uh, and that's part of the reason why um, and part of the reason why blue sharks are so difficult to protect is that they are highly migratory. They move thousands of miles across the oceans and spend most of their time in those international waters, which means that management and enforcement of any management uh, measures is really difficult to take um, because it has to be approved uh, at an international scale. Um, so, um, looking a little bit closely on what we're here for today, um, what blue sharks are doing in our Irish waters. Um, as I mentioned, they're really highly migratory animals and in the North Atlantic where Ireland is, they carry out these large scale uh, cross ocean movements, uh, which lead them to enter Irish waters in the late spring around uh, May time. And they remain here, um, taking advantage of our highly productive summer waters until around early autumn, possibly even later. Um, and during their residency here, Blue sharks, um, which are primarily females actually in Ireland, become an economically important species, uh, specifically as a target for catch and release sport angling, uh, which is a very popular summer activity, both for locals and uh, foreign tourists as well. And on top of that, across the pond in the UK, the last few years have seen a really fast growing demand for snorkel and swim with expedition to see these animals in person below the surface. So it's pretty likely that we're gonna see these type of operations spread to Ireland very soon in the next few years. Um, and for that reason, um, it's really important for us to understand what these animals are doing while they are in Ireland, why Ireland is uh, important to them uh, in terms of behaviors, habitat use. Um, are they feeding here? Are they reproducing here? Um, it's really important for us to know this so that we can make sure that these uh, activities aren't having a negative impact on them uh, and their behaviors, their natural behaviors. So if we look a little bit more closely at the animal itself, um, I told you about their coloration and their, their bodies. Um, but those aren't the only striking features about them. Uh, if we look a little bit closer and compare their silhouettes to their sharky counterparts, one feature in particular stands out, and that's their pectoral fins. Um, so these fins that stretch out of the side of their bodies are kind of like the winds, wings of an airplane. They're angled downwards, uh, and that allows them to glide through the water uh, really easily uh, and smoothly. And these large paddle-like fins allow them to generate the lift necessary to live in these oceanic environments that they live in using very little energy. Kind of like those glider planes that we played with uh, as kids, those toys that we played with us uh, as kids that we threw and tr they traveled a really long distance thanks to their big, uh, long wings. So with that being said, um, my supervisor, Dr. Nick Payne, and some colleagues were able to collect data uh, on the speed that these animals were going at in the water a few years ago. And what that data seemed to suggest was that even with these fins, these big fins that should allow them that, to glide really easily through the water, blue sharks appeared to be swimming far slower, slower than they should be. And what I mean by that is that they were swimming at such slow speeds that it should have been causing them to use up more energy than what they were taking in. So with that in mind, we started thinking about why that could possibly be, what, what was making them swim so slowly. So um, some, we wondered what these sharks maybe were like eating to justify this inefficient swimming. And specifically, was it possible that they were swimming on something that was really low in energy, but highly, highly abundant, that would be really easy for them to eat? Now, studies of blue shark diets in the past have concluded that these animals feed primarily on squid and mackerel. Uh, and the assumption is that that's why they're coming here into Ireland, is that they're following the mackerel into our waters. But one of the events that we see happen in Ireland uh, in temperate waters every year and cyclically during the summer, when the sun comes out and the water warms up, are jellyfish bloom, 
which kind of led us to this wild and slightly wacky idea that maybe these sharks are swimming into Irish waters, finding themselves surrounded by these blooms of slow, really abundant uh, prey and just happily opportunistically chomping down on them. Um, and what seemed a little bit crazy at first was then actually reinforced when we started having conversation with anglers who told us that they had seen blue sharks throwing up dozens of jellies while on deck of their boats. So maybe we were onto something there. But this idea in itself brought with it a lot more ideas. Previous studies, as well as anglers, have all reported that the blue shark population in Ireland is majority female. So what's going on there? Uh, why do we mostly just get females? What are they doing here? Uh, and does it have anything to do with their reproductive cycle? What stage of their reproductive cycle are they in? Are they pregnant? Are they about to mate? Have they just mated? Are they uh, heavily pregnant or in early stages of gestation? All of these questions um, would have implication in terms of what energy they, they are requiring. Their bodies might be investing into developing eggs before being fertilized, or they might be investing into growing pups. So if any of these are true, or whatever, whichever of these is true, what would feeding on jellyfish actually bring them? Uh, what benefit would it have? So last year, uh, to try and answer some of these questions uh, and get a better understanding of what these sharks are doing in our waters, we set out permits in hand uh, with the help of local anglers like David Edwards from West Cork Charters and Sean Maxwell from Cork Mac Sherry Sea Angling Centre um, to find these animals. So we rely really heavily on the knowledge and expertise of these anglers. Um, they know Irish waters like no one else, uh, and they're able to find, catch and handle these sharks safely and efficiently. So once we found the sharks uh, and caught them, uh, the sharks were brought on were brought on board the boat to do our work up. Now we work as fast as possible and we take uh, measures to try and minimize the amount of stress that the animal is under while it's on board the boat. Um, we have to bring it on board in the case of this research, otherwise we would try and keep it in the water, but there are some things that we couldn't do in the water then. Um, so uh, the methods that we use are, as um, Aporic mentioned, biologging, which is the use of electronic devices and tags to record the behaviors of the animals once we release them. And specifically for me, I was really interested in putting cameras on them. Um, the holy grail would have been to capture a uh, shark eating a jellyfish. Um, and then, but that's kind of uh, a shot in the dark uh, if we were gonna catch, uh, capture that on video because the package only stays on the shark for six hours after release, uh, not for six hours, the camera records for six hours, but the tag package, comes off the shark within 12 hours. And we then have to go and find this package that you can see in the top left corner uh, out in the middle of the ocean, kind of like a needle in a very, very big haystack. So uh, I'm obviously relying on uh, other methods to complete the information. In fact, my primary method is tissue sampling for biochemical analyses. So I sample blood, muscle, and a little piece of the fin cartilage to be able to run analyses such as stable isotope analysis, fatty acid analysis, and hormonal analysis. Basically, they give me information on the diet of the animal over the last few weeks and a few months as well as what point in their reproductive cycle they are by looking at the hormones. Um, as another project that a colleague is doing is also looking at stress hormones while they are, uh, while these sharks are caught uh, and released. So what the impact of these activities are having on them. We also take uh, body measurements uh, like length and girth. Um, we look at their sex and any distinguishing marks that they might have on their body, uh, we take photos of. I also attempted to use an ultrasound uh, over the uh, 
uh, on a couple of animals that it takes too long to sort of set myself up and be able to find what I'm looking for. So we gave up on that idea pretty quickly because we wanted to be able to release the animals within 10 minutes, ideally. Um, so any information that we're collecting that we might not use is actually going to collaborators. So we won't really want to get as much information as possible from one shark so that no opportunity is wasted and other people don't have to go out again to catch more sharks to be able to get information that we were able to get ourselves. So with that being said, uh, we had a really successful field season, not only from the point of view of the work, um, we did, it was amazing, but we also were able to build some really strong connections and collaborations with um, the communities and the people that we worked with, which paves the way for a lot more collaborations in the future as well. Um, our field trips were anywhere between one and three days, and we spend our days on the water, waiting for sharks to bite, looking out for any other wildlife uh, that we might get a glimpse of. We were really lucky in July to see a lot of baskin sharks. Um, and if the sea is calm, then it's a great day. If not, Dramamine and Scopolamine are our best friends. Um, but even when the sharks bite and we get back to land at the end of the day, the day isn't over because we then have to sam process all the samples that we collected, do a lot of centrifuging of the blood. But it's all worth it, of course, not just for the experience, but because we then get results that start to come in. Now, I don't actually have any of the answers to the questions I posed to you because I haven't finished my sample analyses. Um, but what I can tell you uh, is that what we found was that we did indeed catch a lot more females than sharks over the five months, uh, five field trips that we were, we went out, we only caught two males in total, uh, the rest were female. Uh, our most successful trip was July, we went out for three days and caught 16 sharks. Um, but really interestingly, in November, uh, we only went out for one day and caught five sharks in one day. So if we'd gone out for three days, it's possible we would have um, gotten the same numbers as in July. Um, and that um, November trip is also really interesting from the point of view of the size of the sharks that we caught. We caught our largest sharks um, at the in the November trip when um, and the biggest one we caught was 2.37 meters, um, so just over two meters long. Whereas the smallest shark we caught was 1.38 meters and was in July. So these results really um, uh, fit with what we've been told by anglers that the smaller sharks arrive earlier in the season and leave earlier, whereas the larger sharks. Uh, female sharks arrive later but stay on for much longer. Um, we successfully placed one camera on uh, one of the two male sharks actually that we caught uh, and it provided six hours of footage and uh, this is just one little glimpse into, um, into the footage where you can see uh, the shark is hit by a sea gooseberry or catena four in the eye and it flinches and closes its nictitating membrane over its eye to protect itself. So I don't know, I'm probably over time, um, but I'm almost done. Um, the next steps for me are to uh, finish processing my samples and, and getting them analyzed, uh, doing all of that data analysis that is the fun but less fun part of the job, uh, sitting in front of the computer. Um, but until I can get that done, I'm actually leaning into the next and final chapter of my PhD, during which I'm going to be looking at slightly more human questions in relation to sharks. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that blue sharks and sharks and rays in general, for that matter, hold a really important place in islands, coastal communities, both economically and culturally. So I'm planning to delve a little bit deeper into this topic to try and understand just how important they are, um, as well as what factors influence the success of operations like recreational angling. So um, who goes on trips to catch sharks? Is it mostly local people or uh, tourists? Uh, and how do they measure the success of their trip? Is it whether they could catch Big sharks, any sharks, uh, if they don't catch any, uh, does the fact that they've seen any other wildlife um, improve their experience? 
Uh, and how does that translate into um, engagement with conservation or policy and just general awareness of um, marine issues? So I'm really excited about um, that project and hopefully I can keep you posted in the future on how it goes. Um, it will also be really important, uh, interesting to be able to influence, maybe um, establish, inform uh, how to safely establish best practices for future operations that might start up like the swim with operations that I was telling you about. So with that, I'm going to uh, leave you, say thank you to everyone that's helped over the last year and a bit. Uh, and who will help our funders. Um, and uh, if you want to follow my work and keep up to date with it, you can find me at the following websites and social media. That's it for me. Thanks so much, uh, Jenny. That was really uh, fascinating. And it's, it's, it's wonderful to see that work uh, being carried out uh, in our waters. There's really there's so much that we don't know about these animals. It's, it's amazing to see that. And um, um, some of Jenny's uh, colleagues are also on Twitter as well. So there's, there's uh, uh, what, what we might do uh, later on is I might just tweet out some of the people uh, who, uh, who are on Twitter and you can, you can see that. And um, the other thing Jenny mentioned uh, in her talk was uh, the commercial exploitation of blue sharks. And um, you might be interested to know that it is illegal to uh, fin, to take the fins off sharks at sea. So when, when these uh, animals are caught, they have to be uh, landed in their entirety and then the fins removed then. But there is a petition at the moment uh, in the European Union to ban the trade in fins uh, because apparently there is still a lot of illegality when it comes to importing and exporting the fins uh, of the sharks uh, so i might um, uh, put a link to that into the chat as well uh, if, if anybody wants to uh, put their name to that uh, petition so thanks again jenny i'm going to move on to our next uh, guest uh, we have uh, emmet johnson coming to us from donegal and emmet is a marine ecologist who was co-founder of the irish basking shark study group um which i think has been around for quite some time now uh emmet will tell us more but uh, certainly it has established itself quite well um and uh uh, we were mentioning before that uh, basking sharks these days are probably Ireland's best known shark and have been uh, getting an awful lot of love and attention uh, these days. Um, Emmett is involved in all facets of the group's activities, including the conservation policy, research, education and community liaison. And he recently completed his PhD in basking shark ecology and his research underpins efforts to make the Basking Shark Ireland's first legally protected shark. So we're probably, there's probably nobody else uh, in the world who can tell us more about Irish Basking Sharks than Emmett. So uh, uh, thanks very much, Emmett, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Barak. I, I don't know how I'm going to follow that introduction now. <laughs> might be uh, <laughs> a little bit down. But um, firstly, I just want to say thanks very much for giving me and the Irish Baskin Shark Group the opportunity to promote our work and the Baskin Shark. And it's really great to see such a sharks. And um, as you say, sharks and rays are most are our most endangered and threatened family of species, and they need action to prevent their demise. So it's great that these um, you know, webinars really raise awareness and understanding of the species. So I'm going to try and open with a video tonight, if I can. Um, hopefully it'll work. And this is really just a Just um, a video taken from drone of uh, basket sharks aggregating on the coast of Ireland off the, off the coast of Clare this summer. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more in detail that we see. Um, initially, I just want to introduce the group. Um, so we were founded in 2009 in the National Fisheries College in Greencastle, where we had a, a, like a seminar like this on, on the species. Um, the overarching goal of the group is to raise awareness and interest and 
increase our understanding of the species, particularly in Irish waters, but we also work internationally. Um, our main at the moment is to gain protection for the species legally in Irish waters. We're one of the last uh, countries in the EU and in the Northeast Atlantic that uh, hasn't provided protection for the species legally. And we have a, an international team from all walks of life, uh, not just researchers and scientists, but also people who are interested in boating, uh, interested in conservation work. So uh, you can find out more details about the group on our website, um, which I'll give the details of at the end. Um, so this evening, I'm going to give a really simple outline of the species, brief synopsis of its history in Ireland, and at the end, I'll touch on recent conservation efforts by the group. It's really targeted at the kind of the, the beginner person, the introduction to Alaskan sharks. I'll be skipping over a lot of the group's more in-depth scientific work. Um, so again, if you want to find out more about that, um, you can go to our website. So initially, the species, historical fishery, uh, recent research, and then on to conservation efforts. So the Baskin shark, it's renowned really for their size. I suppose that's the number one thing that uh, uh, that people are kind of hit by when they see them in real life. A uh, typical size we see in Irish waters is six to eight meters long. So that video you saw there of those fish going around in circles, each one of those is six to eight meters long, which is, you know, a fairly hefty um, animal. They can be as small as uh, one and a half to two meters. We, um, not that that often, but we do see one or two each year, typically in that size category. Um, and they can be as large as up to 11 meters. Um, Baskin shark also have a large mouth, reflects their kind of Latin and Greek name, Ceterhinus maximus, which is the big nose monster effectively. Um, and the nose contains a distinctive amplore de Lorenzo. A kind of a simple description of that is um, it's like a physical attribute, the electronic sensor that sharks have to potentially detect prey or orientate in space. Um, and we need to think about sharks and fish that they operate in a three dimensional world. So uh, it's not as easy as ourselves where you know where you're going, you can look left or right out the window of the car. And um, they're in open water potentially for a large period of, of time. Um, and they don't have those kind of physical references that you or I have when we're operating on land. Um, they also have a really large main dorsal fin, um, and that uh, gave rise to their kind of old name of sailfish. Um, and of course, the characteristic large mouth with uh, gill rakers, uh, five gill rakers. So that's used to sit, or um, some people suggest as a cross row flow filter to concentrate zooplankton into the mouth. Um, they also have very thick skin um, and they carry large quantities of parasites. So their main um, prey species is zooplankton. Um, We've a couple of different species that they principally target in Irish waters, Helgolandicus and Finmaricus, green and red basically in the north or the south of, uh, of, of Irish coastal waters. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, again, like, like Jenny suggested, um, we're only just um, how would you say the kind of the variety of prey species that that Baskin sharks um, focus on. Um, similar to Jenny, we also put video on the shark and we can see them moving through patches of kind of small um, zoo, uh, gelatinous zooplankton or, or jellyfish. So again, it's something to, that we wonder about, are they feeding on, on jellyfish or is it just something that uh, that's also interacting with their balance? So um, early, early fishing efforts, uh, actually the first recorded, um, I would say basking shark fishery in the world comes from Bay. So the oldest historical records come from Irish waters. Um, and it was typically a species that was fished by um, whaling enterprises along the west coast of Ireland. And in fact, uh, sunfish oil, fish, not to be confused with mala mala, but traditionally the basking shark was called the sunfish because of their habit for um, resting lazily or swimming lazily on the surface during sunny weather. Um, and uh, they, they made up actually the, the majority of animals that whaling enterprises caught. Um, and the sunfish oil was seen as second only to spermaceti oil um, in the past when oil was used for lighting um, street lamps, or for um, treating clothes and different um, different things like that. So this is a picture that's taken from um, uh, a research publication from the 
it's about the deep sea and coastal fisheries of Ireland. It's, it's a, quite a famous piece. And it just shows a typical kind of whaling behaviour. You have the large boats in the background, uh, the small little wherries with your harpoonists on the front of the bow, the kind of uh, Moby Dick scene that you'd expect. Um, the more modern fisheries um, started after the second and you know were made more famous by Gavin Maxwell um, Harpoon at Adventure. It's an interesting read and that was based on the west coast of Scotland. But in the graph on the left hand side, I don't know if you can see, there's a small little line that's in blue and that's actually the Scottish fisheries numbers. Um, so there was actually, although it's quite famous and there's a lot of literature around the Scottish fishery, uh, there wasn't actually that many basking sharks caught there. But um, the, the green line there is uh, the ackle fishery in Ireland, which I'll talk a little bit about. And the dotted black line is the Norwegian fishery. Um, so the Irish and Norwegian were by far the most um, intensive and caught the largest numbers. And in fact, the Norwegians fished um, basking sharks in Irish waters until 2006. And they had a 200 ton uh, exchange deal with the EU for a cod fishing quota. So it's quite a recent, uh, a recent enterprise. Fish was still targeted. Um, and they were principally targeted for their large fins, which are used uh, to display um, in the front of uh, shark fin soup. Uh, uh, restaurants or restaurants that sell shark fin soup, they use the large fin to put their menu on. Um, and the oil also is used in, um, in space enterprises because of its viscosity. It's a really good under high and um, uh, cold temperatures. So it has an interesting use um, and that gives it a clue and an indication of maybe what the, the sharks use it for, not going into space, but high pressures and cold temperatures think about it later. Um, so the ackle fishery in Ireland um, wasn't like the traditional fishery that you imagine with the harpoonist. It was actually a static net, net fishery based in Keem Bay on the end of Ackle. Um, so they strung out the net attached to land. The basking sharks came into the bay, swooped around and got caught in these nets, um, wherein the fishermen would row in, dispatch the shark and tow them around to Portin, where they'd be rendered. Um, and I think most of the sharks at that time, it was oil that went into industry. Um, so right up until the 70s. Um, and there's still people alive. I think a man gave an interview recently um, who worked in that fishery. So it's quite modern. And the Norwegian fishery, which is more like the traditional fishery, uh, was based on harpooning sharks. They'd take them on board and they'd render them. Um, and the interesting thing about the Norwegian Actually, a lot of their fishing effort wasn't in Norwegian waters. It was actually based out of Irish waters and out of um, Waterford and Wexford um, and the Irish coast. Um, although we wouldn't associate those ports or those areas with basking sharks, we typically associate them with, with the West Coast. Um, since we've been undertaking research on the shark, we've discovered that the sharks do spend quite a considerable bit of time out in the Celtic Sea in that space between um, let's say Waterford, uh, Welsh coast and uh, North Cornwall. So it's interesting that fishing enterprises were able to pick up on that um, without the kind of modern technologies that we have. Um, so early efforts for conservation and research. Um, on the left hand side, you'll see that's the first satellite tracker that was ever put on a fish um, and the uh, University of Aberdeen. And early efforts did begin in the UK um, and it was a move to collect data to support the listing of the species on CITES, which is legislation that controls trade in endangered species. Something today with regard to finning. Um, and at that time, finning was considered a significant threat, and it still is, um, uh, particularly in, um, in uh, how would you say, um, open, open sea water or the open ocean. Um, and, then, and since then, really, this is one of the most uh, studied shark species probably in the North Atlantic. So there's a lot of information about the shark in comparison to, to other species. Um, and based largely on that information, that's the last 20 years, the International Union Conservation of Nature have classified the Baskin shark as endangered in the Northeast Atlantic. So they're endangered species. Um, 
our early efforts in the group were focused on trying to differentiate between individual sharks and we tried various different ID methods. So photo ID was one of the early ones. Um, and you can see in the top left hand corner there, uh, a shark that had, you know, most likely collided with a boat had been damaged and had a really distinctive fin. So it would be quite easy to recognize that again. Um, and really we wanted to ind identify individuals because this allows us to count sharks. So how many Baskin sharks are there is the first question that most people ask. Is it unusual to shark or 100 sharks or how many sharks are in Irish waters? Um, and you can't do that um, generally unless you can identify individuals or they can adhere to uh, a, a typical or traditional census method, which I'll talk about. Um, and if you can count the number of sharks, you can also recount them and look at if the population trend is increasing or reducing. So basically, do we need to take action about the species? Um, so we found that the photo ID had its limits. Um, and so we turned to visual tagging or basically giving individual sharks a passport number. And that allowed us to differentiate between sharks when they came to the surface. Um, and the group's been very successful with this method. We've deployed over 500 on individual sharks and we've had about 70 recoveries linking quite hotspots. Um, that contrasts with US efforts, which had over 100 deployed in the 80s and they had no recoveries. So that's really interesting that sharks maybe in America, we're moving through the area, whereas sharks here, or maybe it's just down to um, the, the, the kind of revolution in digital photography where people are able to give us <laughs> uh, re-sightings um, with cameras and other technology. Um, we also uh, moved on to uh, slime sampling from the visual ID. We noticed that the visual ID tags got fouled up after a year, so they weren't great for continual uh, sightings. Um, and the slime basically on the sharks provides a, a DNA sample and allows us to continue identifying individuals indefinitely. And it also allows us to investigate kind of population diversity, movement between surface hotspots, associations between individuals and such like. So it's a much more in-depth uh, uh, method. Um, and basically we, we, we kind of just I would just say discovered the method. Um, Simon uh, Barrow and myself were up off Malinhead, and the shark tail just came up onto the side of the boat and rubbed off, left this big black slime on it. So we took a sample and sent it off to University of Aberdeen, and they kindly um, uh, ran their genetic whiz on it. I uh, don't claim to understand it. So, um, and they were able to, to um, begin to kind of, I would just say, understand the makeup of the DNA of the of the species. And from then it's gone on you know, from strength to strength and uh, the methods used now all around the Northeast Atlantic. Um, a simple Brillo pad is used. So uh, very effective and very cheap. Um, beyond that then, uh, individual mark recapture methods, which is what the kind of visual tagging and the slime sampling, those methods haven't yet produce kind of dedicated census that we require to understand how the species kind of used to find marine areas, such as Irish to ter territorial waters. Um, and to do that, we typically turn to kind of dedicated census methods, such as distance sampling. And that involves flying or motoring along a series of kind of survey lines in an effort to sample count the population in a specific area. And this gives you snapshot of the population at a given moment in a given defined area. So you can say in this area, the picture you see there is of uh, Malinhead, the Inishowen area. In the Inishowen area, there was X number of sharks at this particular time. Um, and that allows us to compare trends in the site use or associations with particular oceanic features. So why were the animals here? Why was there this number of the animals there? Um, the problem with basking sharks is that the convention methods are really designed for citations. Uh, so whales and dolphins who are uh, required to come to the surface to breed at regular intervals. And you can kind of calculate that breeding interval depending on the species. Um, so basking sharks don't need to come to the surface to breed because they're fish. So um, also kind of traditional fish population survey, me survey methods, which is effort. So basically, if you want to survey fish, typically you go out and catch them and see how much effort it takes you to, to, um, to get X amount. Uh, so that's not really suitable for basking sharks because of the size of them and because of their endangered status as well. 
Um, so it was a need to um, how much time, uh, basically how much time a shark may spend on the surface um, and what factors might influence that behavior. And that would allow us to use those uh, traditional methods for that were developed for citations. So to that end, we basically developed a surfacing model that linked the surfacing behavior of the basking sharks with wind speed and sunshine. And surprise, surprise, we found that the, sun, the more time the sharks or the more likely the sharks were to be on the surface. Um, so their name of sunfish, which was the kind of traditional name given to them by the fishermen, is a very apt one. Um, and we also used the dive data recorded we basically we used it say we used the dive data recorded attached to sharks for about three to nine days and this allowed us to know where the sharks were within the water column um, and where they were at that particular time or what area they were in and associate the environmental variables and that's what the little graph is on the left hand side that's basically a a a a section through uh, a shark dive profile so lines those squiggles the gray areas are nighttime and the white areas are daytime and that's basically a dive profile of the shark so it goes down and up it spends time on the surface it goes down mostly at nighttime and then it's up on the surface during the daytime so the model also allows us to uh, um, basically to identify periods of time when concept restrictions can be enforced such as go slow periods uh, in surfacing hot spots um, and also to prevent ship strike, basically what we saw in the picture of the fin, the damaged fin. Um, and it also allows us to consider restricted fishing depths during specific environmental conditions. So this is like a tool that you can use in a potential marine protection area, such as this. Um, and the, the model allowed us to correct the survey results from the surface and to reflect how many sharks are actually in the area um, and we've deduced from our survey 20 percent of the atlantic or in some cases the estimated global population use irish waters annually so that's a really uh, significant finding um, and i'm really briefly skimming through some research examples here but again if you want to see kind of this doesn't represent the kind of scope, full scope of the scientific data or conservation work the group have collected or undertaken. So again, our web more detail. Um, in this example here in this slide, by tracking a shark remotely using satellite retrieve data and a fortuitous resight, we linked surfacing hotspots in Ireland, at Mount Head, Scotland in the West Coast and in the US. And this has real big implications about how we manage wide ranging species that operate on an scale like really well beyond our territorial limits so you know it forces us to consider what can we do on our patch but also what who do we need to speak to and who do we need to work with to give proper protection to these species that don't you know um, kind of carry a passport or know or realize oh i'm in irish waters now i'm in scottish waters or i'm in where um in america when they're in those different diff, different territorial areas they have uh, different protection um, applied to them so that's something that you know needs to be more unified and more um, uh, consistent across the across the board um, so really the question what does it all mean or amount to i kind of summarize our findings as that the more we discover about species the more we realize our view is really biased our coastal encounters with them um, and it's more likely the species is kind of a predominantly or uh, a, an open ocean forager that recurrently kind of ventures into coastal areas uh, during the summer months to aggregate and potentially find a mate to breed. Like So we've been looking at them as a kind of coastal species and when then saying, oh, where do they go after that? Uh, they probably spend the majority of their time and their life cycle in the open ocean. Uh, and our time when we interact with them is quite a small portion of their life. Um, and Ireland has a really large number of these aggregation sites and hosts a significant proportion of the global population. So there's a real onus on us to do our part um, in conservation efforts. Um, so ultimately, collecting information and data on a species, it should really underpin conservation efforts. And our work has demonstrated that the sharks frequenting the new Scottish MPA for the species, which was designated last year, uh, are also the same sharks that are frequenting the Irish coast. 
Um, on this slide on the left, the picture shows the satellite track of two sharks from Malmhead to Scotland over a series of days. It's not a kind of a, a, a long time. These animals are moving, uh, you know, in a period of 24 hours between the Republic, Northern Ireland, Scotland. Um, conservation has devolved in the UK. So again, different a different protection um, as they move between those areas. Um, and this year, we confirmed uh, movement between Ackle and that MPA in Scotland, um, and that was through the Queen's University-led um, Element of the Sea Monitor project, which is a really large multi-species research program. So, you know, again, we host a significant proportion of the global population of this species. They're endangered. Um, you know, it stands to reason that we have a significant proportion because we had one of the main fisheries for them. Um, so it's not it's not rocket science, um, but having the science to support uh, uh, lobbying and conservation efforts is essential and is, and is important. So they need that kind of scientific basis to say, you know, we should do this. We need to do this because X, Y and Z. Um, so basically, that's that's it. Um, I'll take some questions at the end and hopefully I didn't overrun on time. Wonderful, uh, Emmett. Thank you so much for that. I mean, I think it's fair to say that the Irish Basking Shark Study Group has transformed and continues to transform our understanding of, uh, of basking sharks uh, in this country. So it's uh, really congratulations on all the work that you've been doing and your colleagues. Um, I'm going to go to our final guest uh, this evening, and uh, Aaron McKeown is the project officer at Ulster Wildlife Shark Conservation Project called Sea Deep. And Sea Deep uh, works to monitor sharks and skates in Northern Ireland to gain a better understanding of how they can be safeguarded for future generations and conservation. So over to you, uh, Aaron. Thank you so much for joining us uh, in your own time. Perfect. No, thank you so much, uh, Podrick and the Irish Wildlife Trust for having us. Um, it's great to speak with so many other great speakers as well. So I'll just get this screen up and sharing. Everybody see that okay? Yes, we're seeing that very good, thank you. Perfect, brilliant. Well, yes, evening everyone. So um, as Podrick said there, my name is Erin and I am the project officer at CD, which is Ulster Wildlife's Shark and Skate Conservation Project. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Ulster Wildlife is Northern Ireland's largest local nature conservation charity. And they've been operating for about 40 years now with the real aim of just safeguarding local wild places and wildlife more so in the north. Um, sea Deep more specifically is their shark conservation project, uh, which has been operating now since about 2018 and just working continuously to gather a greater understanding of sharks and skates that use our local waters um, and ways that we can work to put in place impactful conservation measures to protect them. So for this talk, I'm just going to quickly highlight a few of the many incredible shark species that we monitor and then talk about what we do as a project to actually gain a greater understanding of these species. So it's kind of touched on already, but when people initially think of Northern Ireland or maybe Irish coasts in general, they don't automatically think of sharks, um, but our waters are home to a really wide range of species. So the new red list of cartilaginous fish says that the Irish waters contain, they've recorded 71 species of sharks that have been recorded in our waters. And um, so that's about half the number that live or have been monitored in European waters. So undoubtedly, Ireland is a very important place for these species. Northern Ireland specifically um, has about 20 resident species and about 40 species have been recorded in our waters in total when we include kind of migratory species such as the incredible basking shark that Emma was touching on there. Um, and not only can you see the species in our local waters, but um, our oceans also offer a really important habitat for many of them around Northern Ireland. So for example, the poor beagle, so part of the Lamidae family related to maybe it's more famous cousin, the great white shark. This species is the largest regular carnivorous shark in Northern Irish waters. 
um, they're a fantastic migratory species. So I believe one was actually tagged off the west coast of Ireland and that same individual was recaptured off the coast of Canada about seven years later. Um, so they're making these really massive journeys across the Atlantic Ocean. However, research and data collected from local sea users and anglers in recent years has shown that there may actually be a resident group around Malin Head as well. So just off the north coast of Donegal here. And from that research, they also saw that there was quite a lot of pregnant females present during the summer months. So that's an indication that these species aren't just kind of passing through or visiting our waters, but they may actually be using our waters for really critical life stages. We also have the spur dog, so um, or spur dog or sometimes called spiny dogfish as well, found in our local waters. So they get their name from, you might not be able to see it quite clearly here, but just in front of their dorsal fin, they have a little spur or a little spine. Um, and that spur is used as a defense mechanism as it contains venom. So what spur dogs will do is they will literally roll themselves up into a really tight little ball, similar to how a hedgehog would for protection. Um, so a really unique thing about them. They are both a pelagic and more coastal species, so they can be found quite good movers throughout these habitats. And they tend to travel in very large groups, specifically females will stay together that way. Um, but one of the most interesting things about the spur dogs, for me anyway, is their gestation length. So they have one of the longest pregnancies of any vertebrate. A female will carry pups for on average around two years before they give birth. So they do have, as well as that other life history characteristics, which can kind of hinder population recovery for the species if they are depleted or low in number locally. So on top of that um, pregnancy length, it takes on average 15 years for a spur dog to reach the age that they can reproduce or to reach maturity. Um, then they have that long pregnancy so that's an extra two years for which they kind of have to survive in our more busy seas now without being eaten or um, killed in the likes of bycatch which they're quite susceptible to and then when they do give birth in contrast to um, the blue shark that Jenny was talking about they usually only have very small litters so about two or three pups um, they then like to take resting periods so they may not reproduce for another few years after that so that's a total of 17 years for this species to have their first litter, of which not many individuals will be introduced into the population. So this is why it takes species like the spur dog and many other shark species in our local waters a really long time to bounce back to kind of an abundant population um, if their numbers have declined. And that is why this species is actually listed as endangered on the IUCN red list as well. We also have um, a range of skate species that the Sea Deep Project records. So again, skates are cartilaginous fish, so they're part of the same subclass as your sharks and your rays, so collectively known as elasmobranchs. Confusingly, a lot of our local skates have the word ray in their common names, so thornback ray, spotted ray. This really comes down to them just being named initially on their appearance. So they do look quite similar to the more charismatic relative, so to the rays. Um, but there are some slight biological differences that you can use to distinguish between the two. So you might be able to see, we don't have a comparison photo, but for skates, they tend to have a slightly thicker tail and they'll have um, dorsal fins that have migrated down the length of their tail as well. Whereas rays you'll often see will have that very kind of whip-like thin tail with usually a barb or a venomous barb attached. Um, but one of the main differences or a really good way to tell if it's a ray or a skate is that skates are oviparous. So they lay eggs, whereas your rays are viviparous. So they give birth to live young. And I'll touch on that again um, in a few slides, just as a way of how we kind of monitor these species as well but we just have a really amazing diverse range of skates around Northern Irish waters too. Unfortunately, many of these species are in a bad way locally. 
So the majority of our local species fall between vulnerable to critically endangered on the IUCN red list. Uh, even species that are quite abundant or categorized as least concerned, so your um, dogfish or your thornback, uh, thornback rays have been shown to have kind of localized depletions or be declining locally. So for example, Strangford Lock used to be a real historic stronghold for shark and skate species in the north. Um, and recent surveys have shown that there's really kind of a void now and those species aren't present anymore. So we're seeing declines more generally. That really is the trend for our local shark and skate species. One species of particular importance with very notable declines is the flapper skate. So the flapper skate is kind of the poster boy species for our project at CD. Um, it is one of the largest skate species in the world. So they have been known to grow about three meters from their tip to the end of their tail. So they can be absolutely massive. Um, in Scotland, actually, they sometimes have the common name barn doors. So they're referred to as a nickname because anglers that would maybe have um, recreationally fished for them would compare them in size to kind of a barn door as well and they can live to the age of about 100 so they're really really impressive however all these incredible facts are sometimes overshadowed by the reality that this species is classified as critically endangered on the IUCN red list so a very mighty species that is unfortunately on the verge of extinction so why is this the case well, although uh, the flapper skate and many other, um, or the flapper skate is no longer targeted commercially in the Irish Sea, um, it was historically overfished. So in fact, this skate uh, represents the first clear case of a fish to be brought to the brink of extinction by commercial fishing. The flapper skate was also a really popular sport fish in the 60s and the 70s, and people would travel from all over Europe to Northern Ireland specifically to catch them. We actually found brochures advertising Strangford Lock as a real hotspot to come to um, fish and to catch the flapper skate. Uh, so obviously, yeah, was, people were coming in their droves to catch them. Unfortunately, the most common procedure at the time with recreational fishing was catch and kill. And you can kind of see from these images here, these were taken from Strangford Lock. We've got um, some recreational anglers with flapper skate and um, some other shark species being caught. And it was kind of a combination of these pressures of the commercial overfishing and the recreational fishing that led to the really uh, drastic declines that we saw and we continue to see today for this species. The flapper skate is now protected under the Northern Ireland Wildlife Order. Um, so that's the highest level of species specific protection available within Northern Irish legislation. So it is a criminal offence to commercially or recreationally target the species. If you're angling for this species now, you have to have an appropriate license that ensures that the species is being caught and released for research or conservation purposes only. And given this kind of conservation importance for the flapper skate, DERA, which is the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs in the North, have an obligation or have stated that they have an obligation to implement measures that are going to conserve the remaining flapper skate populations in our local seas. So consideration is being given to spatial protection for any kind of critical habitats for the flapper skate. So this would be sites for foraging and um, nursery grounds. But the real question now for us, CD as a shark conservation project in the region is where are these sites um, how do we find them not only for the flapper skate but for all shark species around our coasts how do we gather that information so that is really where sea deep and our community come into play so at sea deep we work with a variety of people members of the public and we use and really champion citizen science to further our understanding of our local sharks and skate species. So firstly, we have our Northern Ireland angling community and our nationwide tagging program. So we work with anglers all around Northern Ireland and we've trained them up in best practice catch, tag and release techniques. Um, so this allows anglers to catch species of sharks and skates, but in the best way 
that allows them to kind of mitigate any harm to both themselves and to the fish. They can then tag the species with a very simple T-bar um, that has a unique ID code and CDEEP's contact information. But at the same time, we'll also gather information on length, general health, uh, species sex as well. So for example, this image on the right is of a juvenile spur dog, which was actually a first to be caught um, for the project. So it's getting measured there. Um, but that just means if that species is recaptured again, we can then compare the rate of growth, the general health, the movement. Um, but it's also quite an exciting find for the project as if more juvenile spur dogs are caught in the same area, could uh, indicate a very important site for this very vulnerable species. We know the spur dog um, is, you know, a, a vulnerable species on the IUCN red list. Um, so this could indicate that it's a very important site for it when it's in a vulnerable life stage as well. And this just wouldn't have been acknowledged um, without our anglers out at sea catching and tagging the species. Um, so yeah, overall, when fishing, if a species is tagged by the CD project and it's recaptured, we can then look back on our data, uh, look at the unique ID that it was initially tagged with, see how far the species has traveled, or maybe if it hasn't traveled very far and it's kind of showing site fidelity to a region, um, or if it seems like an area is of really critical importance for species um, over time. So just the tagging program, has really helped us build a picture of kind of the movement for these much more elusive species in our waters. We also get the public engaged with local species by just highlighting the data that can actually be gathered from these species without even getting in the water. So this is our egg cases or sometimes more commonly referred to as mermaids purses if you find them on the shore. Um, so as I kind of briefly mentioned earlier, uh, skates will lay eggs, but some of our local shark species do as well. So your dogfish, your bullhuss, um, they'll lay eggs under the water. And when the young hatch, those empty cases will wash up onto the shore and we can find them. The great thing about the egg cases is that depending on the species that laid them, the egg case will have different, it'll have a different appearance or some key ID features. Um, so you can kind of see here we have an identification guide. This is available on our website, but I'll post links in later. Um, but it just allows us to kind of gather an idea if we find quite a lot of one particular egg case, for example, a lot of spotted rays around our coasts, kind of lets us know that we definitely have that species here. And if we find, say, quite a lot of thornback ray egg cases concentrated to one stretch of coast or one beach, that could even indicate that there's a potential breeding area not too far offshore. We recently got two really exciting finds as well for the project on the north coast on Benone Beach. So this was um, the second flapper skate egg case for us for the project to be recorded. We know quite a lot of these are found um, in Donegal, but we don't have so much in Northern Ireland. So this was the second one to be recorded for the project. Um, and it's so exciting to kind of have the egg case of a critically endangered species. Um, it's not confirmation that they're breeding locally because the egg cases, they can be carried in the tides, but we do have tagging records of the species in that area too. So it's really that continued monitoring and a combination of your tagging and your egg case data. It'll help give us a bit of an insight into this critically endangered species going forward, which is really exciting. So with this data, um, so our tagging data and our egg case data, we then select sites around our coast to survey the underwater region and see if we can get any other really interesting sharky finds. Uh, to do so, we work alongside Sea Search, which is a group of volunteer divers who survey the underwater environment for us. And this summer, um, we got some lovely finds. So we got this cat shark egg case in situ under the water. So that's just immediate confirmation um, that the site is being used as a nursery ground for this shark species. And then a lovely shot of an actual um, cat shark as well. So these were captured by Libby Keatley, who's one of our volunteer divers. Um, and then I also have, hopefully this video works. If not, you can just give me a shout. Um, but this was a uh, cat shark as well by Libby Keatley under the water. Um, 
And I know this species is our most common species, so sometimes it doesn't really excite people as much as other species of sharks that we have in our waters, um, but it's still great to kind of see them in their natural environment. For our anglers, they tend to just see these species when they bring them up on board to tag them. So it's nice to show them this footage and they can kind of continue to gather the idea of why they love these species and see them in their natural environment. Um, and even though it is our most common species, there are still declines and we'll have anglers who will have been out on the seas 20 years ago and they'll tell us now that the level, the amount of cat sharks that they bring up is nothing compared to then. So it's still good to be building our data on even the most common of species now in our waters. Um, so we have that data set going into the future. So what next? Um, and what do we what do we do with all this data? So as I mentioned, the flapper skate is a focus species for the CD project. And um, because of its status and its conservation priority, this species, the flapper skate, has been shown to exhibit site fidelity in other areas. So it likes to stay within a region throughout the year. Um, so our aim for us would to be potentially to identify and protect an area of site fidelity for the flapper skate in Northern Irish waters with a marine protected area. So currently there's only one marine protected area for the flapper skate in the world. Um, and that is in the Inner Hebrides in the Loch Sunart of, to the Sound of Jura Nature Conservation MPA. Um, so it can be done and it has been done and that's a fantastic marine protected area for us to look to as an example of what we can do in Northern Ireland as well. And as I mentioned, DERA, who would kind of be the department to uh, put this marine protected area in play, have expressed that they will do so if a site of usage is identified in Northern Ireland. And anglers at CD, we think we've maybe started to identify a potential site for this. And um, so where this red circle is, we have tagged about 65 skate in this region and had four recaptures. So we know that's not a massive number, but for a critically endangered species, Every time we go out there and monitor that area, we tend to be catching and tagging more and more flapper skate. Um, so it seems like a promising area. Um, we also have an area on the north coast. So you might be able to see where that orange circle is. Um, and we only have one angler who is licensed in that area, who's out tagging and monitoring. And he's also bringing um, a stat of quite a lot of flapper skates in that area too. So it's very exciting to know that there are maybe still pockets of abundance around our coasts um, and that we can put some you know, impactful marine conservation measures in play for those species. The flapper skate, it can be a mobile species as well. So there is potential for it to move between Scottish, Northern Irish and uh, Republic of Irish waters. So a marine protected area would really just enhance the connectivity for the species across these regions as well. Um, and again, this initial discovery, this data, it really wouldn't be possible without the work of our angling community and our volunteer anglers. So as a project, we're just going to continue to encourage kind of further monitoring in the seas around Northern Ireland for the flapper skate and other shark and skate species as well to advocate for protection. Um, so before I leave you, um, just a final few reminders of how you too can help support the CD project. So the first one's really simple, is just search for shark and skate egg cases when you're at the beach. If you're at the beach or you're at the coast, it's really simple and really easy to do. You've probably come across mermaids per uh, purses before as well, but it's really just a matter of kind of looking along the strand line or looking at the beach. Our website has a lot more details on how you can do it. And it also has ID guides. It has games, activities to kind of get everybody involved in egg case hunts as well. And then when you do find some cases, it's simple as submitting your data to us through our website as well. And just like that, you have contributed to shark conservation without even having to get in the water. You can also come along to some of our events that we have throughout the year. Uh, so we'll usually advertise these on social media or on our web, our web page. Um, but if you come along, you show us a bit of support, but also just learn a lot more about these species. And you might be able to meet Tag as well, who's kind of our life size to scale flapper skate model that you can maybe see in the photo. Um, and Tag's just a fantastic tool to kind of engage people, draw people in um, and kind of get them excited about a species that's so impressive that they didn't even really know was in our local waters in the first place. 
Uh, to support the wider work and conservation in Northern Ireland, you can become an Ulster Wildlife member as well. And for January, it's actually half price. So it's only uh, £1.50 a month to help us just continue to do our work to protect local wildlife. But I'll pop um, kind of links to CD and Ulster Wildlife's web page in the chat if you're interested or want to find a little bit more. And finally, you can follow us on social media. So at the bottom there, you can see it's CDNI and we're on Twitter and we're on Instagram. And by following us, you'll just continue to learn a lot more and keep up to date with all the key stages that we're taking as a project to work to conserve these species going forward. Um, but yes, other than that, I'll just say thank you so much for listening and tuning in. And yes, any other questions, feel free to ask away. And my email address is also on the screen there if you want to get in touch about anything else. Um, feel free to do so. That's no problem at all. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Aaron. Wonderful work. And I know um, the CD project has been going on for a number of years now, and it's it's great to see, uh, you know, the data mount and, uh, you know, when you're beginning to see trends and, and maybe, you know, hotspots emerging uh, that can be used for, for actual uh, conservation work uh, on the ground. People will also uh, maybe have noticed that you said that the flapper skate was a protected species in Northern Ireland, which is very interesting because in the Republic we have no sharks or fish of any kind which are protected species uh, which is uh, which is a major issue we've been trying to highlight in the Irish Wildlife Trust for a number of time that we really need to uh, to give some of these species and, and marine invertebrates and so on the proper legal protections uh, that they require. Now we've got uh, maybe about 10 or 15 minutes uh, for some questions and thank you so much to everybody uh, for sending your questions in and um, let me see uh, Jenny I'm going to go to you first uh, there's been a couple of questions on this team um, but Lucia has asked um, would snorkeling and scuba with sharks be considered ecotourism or can it be prejudicial for the sharks coming to Ireland. And this is very interesting, I think, to people because particularly the basking sharks, and Emma might have something to say about this, uh, on social media are getting a lot of attention uh, from people uh, and snorkelers. So what do, what do you think? Is it a good or a bad thing? Uh, like many things, I think it depends. Uh, it depends on uh, the practices that are, uh, how it's done essentially. So, um, uh, it can be very beneficial in terms of uh, raising awareness, uh, allowing people to interact with these animals and um, correcting their bad image a little bit. Um, but it has to be done properly. Um, so with best practices put in place, um, respect towards the animals. So, you know, for Baskin Sharks, the Irish Baskin Shark Group has some uh, really great advice on how to interact safely uh, for the animal and for yourselves. Um, um, when you're in the water or on the water with the animal. And that advice is very much um, applicable to most species, um, um, if not all species of, of marine wildlife. Um, it's about uh, keeping your distance, allowing animals to come towards you rather than going towards them, uh, not harassing them. Um, so it can definitely be done well, um, um, and so long as it is, it can be very beneficial. And do you think legal protection uh, is something that is required uh, for species like the blue shark or would that make any difference? Uh, it's um, it, in terms of in interactions with the animals, it can definitely um, be a good thing to have legal protection, um, but uh, it's a it's a difficult and complex one because you have to consider everyone that is being impacted by those legal protections as well. Um, so, again, it's very much dependent on how the legal protection is put in place. And, and finally, maybe just on the I mentioned that uh, petition that we posted a link to. Um, uh, would you agree with, with the, the sentiment of that petition? Is that a major issue, the trade in, in fins in, in the EU? 
feel like I'm repeating myself, but it's a complex, again, it's another complex issue because um, I think a lot of the time what's uh, overlooked when it comes to shark and, and shark fisheries is the fact that um, there's a lot of consumption of shark meat uh, and that's the case in the European Union. And so it can be that fins are a byproduct of the the uh, of shark fishing um, and over time has become a prime, you know, a primary source of of um, of uh, profit because they are so profitable. But they have historically been targeted for their meat uh, uh, as well as for their fins, if not more in a lot of places. So it's complex, and um, I, I, I've gone back and forth in my opinions. And the more I learn about these animals, the more I learn about um, about policy. Uh, my opinion changes over time. So I don't have a definite one, and and I probably don't have enough expertise in the matter to give a definite one. But it's really important to inform yourself. Uh, yeah, it, and it's interesting you raise the complexity of it uh, because. Uh, the blue shark is not quite like other fish in terms of how it is exploited. Uh, it isn't managed by um, the ICs, which is the body that, that you know, manages cod and place and these other okay. things. I, I, personally, I have found it very hard to get information on blue sharks and what the fisheries assessments for them are. I don't know if that has been your experience. Yeah, um, yeah, no, it, it is uh, hard. Um, and as I said in the presentation, it's because so much of their life is spent on the high seas and because they are so valuable to many of the fin and meat trades um, that, that it, they are, nations are very reluctant to, be, to want to protect them and manage them as well. Um, there was a really interesting paper that came out, a uh, study that came out a few years ago about how, um, these sharks, along with mako sharks, uh, overlap a lot with longline fisheries where they weren't originally the target, but because they're going after the prey that these uh, fisheries are also going after, they've ended up overlapping and being caught more so than the prey. Um, and that's happening out in the middle of the oceans where we there are no regulations. Um, so it's a uh, it's difficult to be able to protect a species like that where they spend most of their time traveling for thousands of miles from one nation to the other into areas where there are no national jurisdictions um and it's why it's so important to understand to try and understand them better and and find out where there are maybe areas of the world that would be more important to them than others whether it's for reproduction mating um or, or feeding mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um which brings me on to maybe another question i have here and um uh, Emmett, i'll put this one to you perhaps uh, it's from mike and mike uh, is asking what is your opinion on how to better protect migratory ocean sharks uh fishing technical measures or with marine protected areas or a blend of both and if it is a blend do we have the required existing management regimes in place i think i know the answer to this but go ahead <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there's a uh, several elements to that question i suppose um I, t I touched on in 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 my brief talk really that you know say the basket shark for instance which i talked about it's an animal widely across the ocean so it can be in what we would call irish territorial waters one day in UK territorial waters, which are different jurisdiction now outside of the EU um, and conservation legislation, could be in Norwegian waters or um, in Canadian or North America or US waters um, a year later or six months later. So these animals are subject to different, um, let's say, legislative kind of protection. And that's where the kind of in international treaties come in. And Ireland, um, you know, needs to, let's say, uh, do its bit in the likes of OSPAR in the Northeast Atlantic um, and the CMS treaties as well. And we've often kind of overlooked them or seen them as a bit of soft power, as something that we, you know, we sign up to treaties, but we don't know about it, um, the species that we sign up to or that these are listed in various annexes on these species. So that, that, that's where we can start. Um, certainly, we need to collaborate 
with our international partners, as the politicians put it, um, and our neighbours, uh, most importantly, um, when we want to do conservation efforts. Now, at home, there's different ways of approaching conservation. You know, the, the, the obvious way that Ireland has dealt with conservation of basket sharks, we basically said, OK, we're no longer going to target fish them. And we saw that, or the EU um, principally uh, made that decision in 2006 and 2007. And um, so we put a zero quota on them, but they were still classed as fish. They weren't classed as wild. So they weren't subject to the kind of wildlife legislation uh, that really allows uh, scientists and conservationists to take more proactive action uh, in the protection of a species. So that kind of mindset or change of viewing a fish as a, a, a kind of an exploitable resource to, to view in it as a wildlife species or something that's uh, important to kind of wider marine biodiversity is a kind of a change in our psyche and a change in our mindset that we need, we need to kind of travel that, um, that journey. And we haven't quite uh, um, done that yet in Ireland. We are hoping to um, that the Baskin shark will be put on the Wildlife Act uh, in the coming months committed to doing that. Um, but again, we need the research and we need the data to support those decisions. It can't be just done on a whim uh, because we think it's, uh, uh, it's good because it does, as you talk about, it does have impacts on people's livelihoods. Um, and certainly if, if, we, if we take measures in our patch within the area that Ireland decisions, um, then we can kind of move to looking at kind of uh, conservation measures in the high seas or more open waters. With regard to MPAs, um, the legislation is uh, in preparation at the moment, I suppose. Well, I mean, the framework, uh, Managing Ireland's framework and new planning legislation with regard to the marine is in preparation. The uh, sp a marine spatial plan. Um, has been prepared in the last few years. The legislation for MPAs and acting MPAs is going to be a separate piece of legislation that hasn't been um, drafted or gone to consultation stage. But the Department of um, Housing did have a consultation recently with regard to expanding the marine network in Ireland. And, you know, a lot of individuals and groups, I'm sure that I, uh, Irish Wildlife Trust, uh, imported to that. Um, and, you know, at this stage, it's with that department and they're going to look at how best to kind of to do that. Certainly, Ireland is a laggard in, 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 in that camp. Um, you know, we have a, a very small proportion of our waters protected. By 2030, we have signed up to protect 30 percent of our waters. Currently, we're at, I would say, probably single digits. Um, and that would be mainly European um, and designation. So it would be coastal sites. We do have a few offshore cor coral sites designated under OSPAR. Um, MPAs are uh, uh, nice on a map. Uh, how to make them real uh, in the real world. You need tools. You need, um, uh, how would you say, methods that are going to be applied to species such as the model that I show, that's just an example of how you can, more information about a species, how they behave in their environment or a particular location, allows you to avoid or mitigate the risks that might be um, uh, threatening the species. So say you have a bad, like, I'll give a good example. At Malinhead, there was over 100 uh, salmon fishing boats used to fish out of Loxville right at one stage. Baskin sharks there. And you did get bycatch, but it was very little compared to the, you know, that's 100 miles of salmon fishing net at night time. Uh, why weren't there just, you know, huge droves of bycatch with Baskin shark during the 60s and 70s and 80s? When we looked at the dive behavior of the Baskin shark, we realized that they're predominantly on the surface during the daytime and at night time, they're way, uh, they're a lot deeper in, uh, in, in the water column. Uh, the salmon fishing is in the top five meters or six meters of the water column at that time now salmon fishing is over but it shows you that you know it just by it wasn't by 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 design it was just by accident that the fishing effort was undertaken at a time when the sharks were you know less likely to go so there you know you know therein lies a hint to potentially how we can kind of try to manage areas where sharks are 
aggregating or foraging um, where they're at their most vulnerable, you know, complete um, a cessation of activities is probably, you know, the, 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 the kind of the hammer. But we also need other tools like screwdrivers and, and the plan to be able to pick away um, mm. and reduce the risks. Yeah, absolutely. That's, absolutely. that's my long winded answer. <laughs> yeah, no, very good, very good. And we'll give a shout out to Jennifer Whitmore at this point, who has the, who is the TD who has proposed um, uh, listing the basking shark on, on the Wildlife Act, which we hope will be successful. Um, lastly, uh, Aaron, I'm going to go to you and I'm going to ask you two difficult questions, if you don't mind. Uh, one is from me. Uh, you pointed out that there is a marine protected area in Scotland, the only one in the world for flapper skate. Um, what difference does that make to the flapper skate? Does that marine protected area have management measures in place that are actually, you know, allowing the skate to recover? Yeah, so it's still early days to really see what the impacts have been for the flapper skate in that area. Um, one of the main measure, management measures that's put in place there, that would potentially be something that we would really want to focus on um, is the, you're not allowed to use what they call tickler chains on any um, trawling equipment in the region. So there was a few studies done uh, specifically on kind of bottom dwelling species, skates and rays that showed that um, when these tickler chains were applied to the back of trawler nets, which essentially kind of weigh down or almost tickle the ground and encourage species to kind of move up a little bit in uh, the water column and then be taken in by the net. Um, once those are removed, the bycatch rate for your larger species like your flapper skate dropped dramatically. Um, I can try to find those research papers as well and put them in or send them on to you. Um, so that seems to be one of the main management tools that's in place in the marine protected area that is in um, Scotland. So sorry, also, uh, Aaron, that, that is in place? Um... That's what, yeah, that would be kind of within their legislation there. Um, a lot of the fishing, though, that does go on still in that region for the flopper skate would mainly just be um, recreational by anglers. Um, and in a way that is, it's not encouraged, but when it's ongoing, the kind of likes of the Scottish um, tagging program in that region do work alongside anglers quite a lot to kind of train them up again, like we would train our anglers in best practice tagging techniques. So it means within the angling community, there's a lot more of an appreciation for the species and a lot more passion for wanting to kind of conserve them as well. Um, and it also means that you're getting the data too, because um, I think as people have touched on, or Jenny certainly touched on with kind of anglers, they're the ones out at sea, they're the ones with the resources, they're the ones with the tools to help us gather that data. Um, but I think time will still have to tell if the region works to firstly kind of maintain the populations at the moment in that area. Um, it definitely is a stronghold even within kind of UK and Irish waters. And then after that, if they um, increase in number as well in that region, but I think that's the thing with kind of sharks and skates for a lot of a lot of them. That's going to take a long time for us to even start to see mm -hmm. kind of the benefits coming through. Um, but yes, that MPA is definitely one that we are kind of looking to for inspiration when it comes to maybe further down the line being able to implement similar management measures in some shape or form uh, within Northern Ireland as well. Yeah, yeah, very much. I suppose it just comes back to our general issue about marine protected areas doing the actual protecting and uh, and the, the urgency which, which this needs to be done. Uh, finally, um, Aaron, there's a question there from Mark and he asks you, what penalties are involved in breaking the ban on the flapper skate uh, fishing, I presume? And have there been any instances of this on record? Um, yes, yeah, so the flapper skate is protected under the wildlife order. Um, so that's kind of DERA's, uh, their order. So they really do monitor the seas that way to make sure um, it's being kept and people are, that they are approaching the flapper skate, they are licensed. Um, thankfully, there hasn't really been that many instances of it being broken because, well, hopefully that means that there aren't that many people who are approaching 
for going out to purposely um, target the flapper state without a license. It can also mean just because we're working in a marine environment, so it's a very difficult area to police and monitor because it's so vast. Um, from what I've seen, there kind of has only been recently one person who's maybe been um, held to account for targeting flapper skate in Northern Ireland waters without a license. Um, and they just got quite a hefty fine landed on them. Um, but what I tend to see working with the angling community in Northern Ireland, the angling community there is very small. Um, everyone tends to know everyone, but there is within the CD project, at least in our trained anglers, a real passion and love for these species and a real appreciation of why that license is in place. Um, so thankfully with our anglers, when they go through our tagging and our training, we don't kind of just train them in, oh, here's how you tag the species and on you go. We kind of train them in um, the importance of these species in our waters, uh, the importance historically for the angling community in Northern Ireland as well to kind of tie in that link. Um, so thankfully, once people are aware, people are trained around the license, we're lucky that we haven't seen a lot of it being um, faulted in any way. But if that is the case, I suppose it really depends on kind of what the situation is or what's happened. Um, but I think if you don't have a license, it'll kind of start off with a fine and maybe progress from there, depending on what it is. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, well, wonderful. Look, I'm, I'm, we're, we're going to wrap up now and um, I want to thank uh, you all, uh, Jenny and Dennis and, and Aaron, uh, for your wonderful talks. And um, thank you to everybody at home for, for tuning in and asking your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to, to all of them. Um, but I think you'd agree that it's been wonderful to hear about the, uh, the, the work that's been going on uh, to, to bring attention to these uh, fascinating and, and sadly endangered animals and we, we very much hope that we can see some some action in the in the in the short term uh, that will actually bring some protection to our seas. Just to remind you again that our uh, this webinar has been recorded and it will be online uh, shortly. You can watch back and um, tune in next month. We're going to be talking rewilding. Um, I'll, I'll give you more detail on that nearer the time. Uh, that'll be in early February. Um, and so thanks once again to everybody. And uh, I'll wish you all a good evening and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you.